Good morning. I think most of you are knowing me. I think you're all getting used to me saying, what's your name? So I'm Laura Wessels. Uh, Tim and I are still pretty new to Trinity Church. It's, we are so glad to be part of this family. I'm an elder here. I'm also um, a pastor in the Reformed Church. So it's um, my work. I work for Rainbow Hospice in uh, Jefferson, Wisconsin. Um, so I don't get to preach too often, so thank you for letting me bring, bring the word this morning. Brent, Pastor Brent is, I guess you would say he's on vacation, but he's really taking a class this week. So that's why I am here in his place. One of the things that we have come to value is allowing you to ask questions. If you hear something in the message that you have a question about, and so I have decided that I'm going to follow Pastor Brent's lead. And if you have a question about what I bring today, um, I want to invite you to text your question. The, the phone number will be on the screen, and I will do my best to answer that question at the end of the sermon. So our title today, my title is Daily Bread. And as I said, I'm, I work as a grief counselor and oftentimes when I make that first phone call to somebody and say, um, how are you doing? They often say right back, well, I'm taking it one day at a time. And there's probably no better way to describe how their life has changed and they are in this new normal. And that new normal can only be faced in one day chunks. I think that same idea is expressed when we pray, give us this day our daily bread in the Lord's Prayer. Now, can we, can we imagine living from one day to the next, every day simply praying for God to provide enough bread for that day? Well, let me answer that question for all of us. No. <laughs> That's something we can't imagine. But these words were first given to a nation that truly understood subsistence living. It was not only their current reality where they were when Jesus first spoke these words, but it was also their history. I wonder when Jesus gave them those words in the Lord's Prayer, was it his way of reminding them of their time in the wilderness, when they waited, when they were in between. They were in the wilderness and there was no food there in the desert. So God provided manna so that they would survive. It miraculously covered the ground six mornings every week for 40 years. I want to invite you, if you want to, to open up your Bibles, whether it's in front of you or you can follow along on the screen. We're going to hear these words from Exodus 16, verses 17, and part of 18, and verse 21. The Israelites did as they were told. Some gathered much, and some little. And they went, when they measured it by the omer, which is a two-quart measure, the one who gathered much did not have too much, and the one who gathered little did not have too little. Each morning, everyone gathered as much as they needed, and when the sun grew hot, it melted away. In Deuteronomy 8, verse 3, when Moses is coming to the end of his time of leading the Israelites, he reflects back on this manna, and he calls the time of manna a humbling experience. Mo Moses said God caused the people to hunger, and then he fed them manna, a food that no one had known before, or for that matter, since. This was part of the Israelites' wilderness time, where they were kept from entering the promised land, because of their lack of trust in God. They'd been delivered from 400 years of slavery in Egypt, 
God had revealed his power to them in the ten plagues that finally caused Pharaoh to send them away, and the parting of the Red Sea as well, where they were miraculously delivered away from the Egyptian army. But now, now they would have 40 years of wandering in the desert. They would experience a 40-year delay of God's promise to them coming true. So there was no food in the desert, and their complaints of hunger had led to God's daily provision, manna in the morning and quail in the evening. Every morning as they gathered their bread for the day, they would have been aware that God had placed it there for them. It hadn't grown. It wasn't a crop. It was given to them directly from God. The act of picking up that manna and placing it in the basket could have been accompanied by thanksgiving to God. Thank you, God, for this manna so we have something to eat today. But their complaints continued. When they were thirsty, in the very next chapter of Exodus, Exodus 17, they asked, Is the Lord among us or not? And when Moses was on the mountain with God, receiving the Ten Commandments, when he was up there for too many days, they took their gold and they fashioned the calf because they needed, they said, gods who will go before us. And as their wilderness years continued, Numbers 11 verse 1 records that they complained about their hardships. And then, after the spies returned from exploring the land of Canaan, the promised land that God had set aside for them, they believed, they decided, there was no way that they could defeat the people of Canaan. And Numbers 14, verses 2 through 4, records what they said. All of the Israelites grumbled against Moses and Aaron, and the whole assembly said to them, if only we had died in Egypt or in this desert. Why is the Lord bringing us to this land only to let us fall by the sword? Wouldn't it be better for us to go back to Egypt? And they said to each other, we should choose a leader and go back to Egypt. They didn't display gratitude. In fact, it was acutely opposite of that. They were ungrateful. They were critical. They were frightened. They were entitled. They really believed they deserved their daily manna. In fact, they complained about the manna itself. They longed for the Egyptian cuisine of their slavery. Numbers 11 says, Oh, we remember the fish we ate in Egypt at no cost. Also the cucumbers and the melons, the leeks, the onions and garlic. But now we have lost our appetite. We never see anything but manna. Who here is familiar with Keith Green? Anyone remember Keith Green? My sister Lois, way to go Lois, and Lonnie. <laughs> I think that really puts us right in the same spot. So Keith Green was a Christian musician in the 70s and the early 80s. He's, look him up, because he's got amazing music. He wrote a memorable song called, So You Wanna Go Back to Egypt. And if I had a voice, I would sing it for you, but my kids assure me that's not the case. Like, I imagine I have the tune, but I don't. So, but he says, he says, so you want to go back to Egypt where it's warm and secure? And then he kind of does this whole diatribe on their complaints about manna. In the morning, it's manna hotcakes. 
We snack on manna all day. And we sure had a winner last night for dinner, flaming manna souffle. Oh no, manna again? <sighs> manna waffles, manna burgers, manna bagels, filet of manna, manicotti, buh, manna bread. It's a pretty good song. Check it out on YouTube this afternoon. Their day-to-day -day existence, subsisting on manna, really got to them. And Walter Brueggemann, in his commentary on Exodus, reflects, in the wilderness, their primary concern is anxiety about survival. They keep wondering if they're going to survive. But now, as we move from Exodus to the book of Joshua, we find the Israelites at the end of their wilderness time. They'd already crossed the Jordan River in miraculous fashion. Just as they left Egypt through walls of water, they entered the promised land through walls of water, through the parted waters of the Jordan River. And as they prepare to march on Jericho, we read these verses. They're found in Joshua 5, verses 10 through 12. On the evening of the 14th day of the month, while camped at Gilgal on the plains of Jericho, the Israelites celebrated the Passover. The day after the Passover, that very day, they ate some of the produce of the land, unleavened bread and roasted grain. The manna stopped the day after they ate this food from the land. There was no longer any manna for the Israelites. But that year, they ate of the produce of Canaan. Wow, the manna was gone. That stuff, that white stuff that the people gathered every morning for 40 years would no longer be predictably, comfortingly on the ground, providing food for an entire nation. Camped out in the promised land, they ate their first meal that didn't feature manna as the main ingredient. They feasted on the produce of the land. Can you imagine? Can you imagine how amazing that food tasted? The unleavened bread, there must have been an aroma because it was bread. So the heavenly aroma of the bread, the nutty flavor of it, Roasted grain, which may have had a smoky or savory flavor with it. It was something, the bread and the grain, it was something that they'd be able to chew and crunch and taste maybe the flavor of salt instead of the sweet honey taste of manna. Their stomachs that night were full. They were full of something other than manna. The wilderness, for them, was over. God had delivered on bringing them to the promised land. Ralph W. Klein reflects on, on that wilderness time and God's purpose. He says, God's promises had come true. The manna was always only a stopgap measure, designed to come to an end after 40 years. From now on, the Israelites would raise wheat and the barley and forget what a miracle daily bread is. Would they forget that first meal in the land? Would they forget their joy at the return to normalcy? Now that's sort of kind of the whole point here today that this account of the manna ending should be reason for celebration. It signaled the end of their wilderness wanderings and the beginning of a life 
in land, in a land that flowed with milk and honey. And again, Walter Brueggemann observes another temptation. In the promised land, the temptation is complacency about self-sufficiency. On May 23, the school community of Central Wisconsin Christian, where my husband Tim teaches, they gathered for the first time for over a year for a meal and celebration. We ate food together and we sang together inside a building without masks. It was incredible. Our superintendent, Mark Butine, he reflected, and maybe I should give Mark the credit for your, this, this message today, because it began with these words. He reflected on how the Israelites' experience of daily manna in the wilderness was how we had all experienced our daily existence during the pandemic. We had wandered in the unfamiliar territory of lockdown. Just as the Israelites had that in-between time in the, in the wilderness, I think that's how we experienced life for those, the last year. It was an in-between time. We weren't going forward. We were just waiting. We have spent the past year plus, we're just been surviving. Taking the pandemic, taking the pandemic, similar to someone who's newly bereaved, taking the pandemic one day at a time. Each 24 hour period didn't contain manna for us, but relentless news of the pandemic. And I think, I think we began relying on God in a way that may have been new to us. Early in the pandemic, again, I didn't wake up to manna on the ground, but to my own fear of what this shutdown meant. How this pandemic impacted the people I loved and wanting desperately for it to be over. I know you can relate to that desire for it to be over. We just wanted it done. We just wanted to go back to normal. But at what point did we actually just decide to settle into that day-to-day -day existence, living in an in-between time? And just as the Israelites settled into gathering manna every day, we began to settle into daily living without the planning ahead that we've been so accustomed to. It's how I live life. It's how I keep my control by planning ahead. We took lots of walks and began exploring our local parks and trails. In fact, I wonder, Horicon Marsh must have had a record year last year of visitors, don't you think? One of our options was the marsh. We cut out hearts for our windows as a way of expressing love and hope. We chose television shows to watch together. We dusted off our board games. We made phone calls that lasted longer. We may even have started to write letters again. Life was slower. Life was surely simpler. We hoped for change that would last well beyond the forced quarantine. How did we survive 2020 and the beginning of 2021? I really think that we survived by shutting down, by numbing, by, by disengaging. I think we found the loss of any sense of community because we were cautioned from getting too close to others. We made a dent in our couches instead of making an impact on the people in our neighborhoods around us. 
I think we learned how to waste time. Not thinking or feeling too much was a strategy for surviving, for this new way of living one day at a time. And some things happened as a result, things that seem very similar to what the Israelites experienced. We found ourselves disconnected. Most of us had a group of people we spent time with, but outside of that small group, we were not really spending time with other people. And then that mask that kept us from recognizing people or it kept us from gauging how another was when we did encounter a friend. The distance from others, yep, it was a social distance, but it was physical, it was emotional, it was spiritual. In every way possible, we felt distance from the people in our lives. Just like the Israelites, when Moses met with God on Mount Sinai to write the Ten Commandments, the Israelites felt so far from God and from their leader, they felt so alone that they fashioned a golden calf to worship. We became discouraged during the pandemic, I read something really interesting about the word discouragement. He said, the, the person, uh, uh, he, I'm forgetting his name. Did I put it up there? Oh, I'm so sorry. I'm forgetting his name. Um, but he said, you're literally discouraged. And so it's when a courage you used to have previously has been taken away from you. And he used the example of Elijah. Elijah famously took on all the prophets of Baal to see who was the one true God. And of course, their God, Baal couldn't produce fire and God produced a fire so strong that it destroyed rocks and it sucked up water. And after that huge victory where Elijah showed huge courage, he went off to the desert because Queen Jezebel threatened his life. Elijah lost his courage. Now, in our case, I think we may have had courage for a while, and I think we had courage at the beginning when everything was new, and let's face it, it was a little exciting because it was new. I surely enjoyed the novelty of working from home for a while. I have a long commute. But eventually, I felt isolated and I felt unsupported. I felt alone. I worried about my kids. For both of them, their work had been profoundly impacted by the shutdown, and I was afraid for them. Plans were canceled, and there were no, no new plans were made. Man, I lost my courage. I think we lost our courage. Again, in the same way that the Israelites were so depleted by their wilderness experience that they lost their courage to conquer the promised land. And then our discouragement led to anger, didn't it? Those bright cutout hearts that graced the windows, signaling that we were in this together, they faded quicker than I ever would have imagined. And those faded hearts were replaced with hatred and ugly words and division. Wearing masks or not wearing masks. Is COVID just a conspiracy? The death of George Floyd and the resulting rioting a really nasty political election. Truly, the word to describe the pandemic is division. Similarly, the Israelites, they complained, they accused. They actually wanted to go back to Egypt. They thought slavery was better 
than the wilderness. And just like the Israelites, our day-to-day -day existence, it really got to us. Then here we are, and the pandemic is really mostly over for us. And just like we wiped the dust off our board games, now it's our masks that are gathering dust. I've thrown some away. We're gathering. In fact, maybe the, the thing to celebrate for you Wisconsin, us Wisconsin people is the fact that the brewers are going to be at full capacity this week. They're calling June 25 reopening day. We're making vacation plans. Finally, things are going back to normal. And I heard a beautiful phrase describing what's happening. These are returned blessings. Returned blessings. Tim and I went, wandered through a Walmart about a month ago when we were maskless and we were shopping for lawn chairs in anticipation of summer events. And I said to him, I don't want to take this for granted. I want to stay grateful for this moment of normalcy. And I just I want to be so honest with you. As I wrote this message today, as I wrestled with this message, I wondered if my message for you was going to be too critical too negative. And if that's how you're experiencing my words this morning, I truly do apologize. But my purpose was to bring to our attention, including my own, how much we respond to both hardship and blessing in the same way as the children of Israel. We respond with complaint, and then we respond with complacency. If the Israelites weren't grateful for the daily provision of manna, would they be grateful for a land that provided their food? Robert Coote, in his commentary on Joshua 5, says, God's blessing often leads us to forget its ultimate source instead of remembering it. And if we weren't grateful for the space the pandemic provided for introspection and simpler living, will we be grateful for restoration? As we experience the restrictions of the pandemic lift, may we truly be grateful. May we truly view normalcy as God returning blessings to us. When our pastor of many years moved on from our church in Fulton, where Tim and I lived most of our married life, it was a, such a painful leaving. He and his wife didn't want to leave. They just really felt like God was calling them to a new church. And on Thanksgiving Eve, Pastor Dave celebrated communion with Second Reformed Church in Fulton one last time. And before they had the sacrament of communion, Dave preached. His message that evening was a list of all the ways he was thankful for the second family. That was it. That was his message. Just a list of ways he was thankful. It was a beautiful and memorable message of thanksgiving. Psalm 100 exhorts us similarly, enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. For the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. I'm gonna take a risk right now, Trinity Church. I want to invite you to live into this psalm right here this morning on Sunday, June 20th. What are you grateful for? Does anyone want to testify right here to a way that God has returned a blessing to you? I just want to invite you to 
you can, I have the microphone here, you can come up and share. Does anyone want to stand right where they are and testify to a returned blessing that you're thankful for? Thankful for good health. Thank you. I'm thankful for you for starting this. Thankful for Father's Day, absolutely. Thankful for our fathers. Thankful for the privilege of being a father, absolutely. Thankful that we can get together with our families again. Wow, absolutely. We're so thankful that we can get together with our families again. Truly, such a gift that we don't want to take for granted again. Nice. Thankful for volunteers who can serve and reach out to others. I mentioned how we made a dent in our couches, and now, now that our blessings have been returned to us, we get to return those blessings to our community. What a privilege it is that we get to reach our community and serve our community. Ah, uh, I am, we are thankful that God is still in control. And he shows us that. He shows us that. If we have eyes to see. So let's be thankful too for the way God shows us that. That he is in control. Thankful for seeing smiles on faces. I have to tell you, because we have time, we have all sorts of time. Working at Rainbow, you know, we had new people that were hired during the pandemic that I didn't know, but we were always in masks. And I remember one day walking past a new person and smiling at her. And then I, I came back and I said, I just want you to know that I was smiling at you. But I, because I realized I had a mask on and she said, well, I could see it in your eyes. But yes, aren't we glad to see people's smiles? Aren't we glad? Aren't we surprised by if we didn't know somebody? Like that mask covered up a lot. It's so good to see your faces. That's a gift. Thank you for sharing. And if we didn't learn as much as we had hoped during the pandemic, if we didn't make the meaningful changes that we had wanted to, we can still choose today. We can choose today to keep living one day at a time. We can choose today to be thankful that God's grace is sufficient. We can choose today to live with gratitude for all the ways that God blesses us. We can be thankful today for our daily bread. Would you pray with me? Oh, Lord, thank you. And maybe we need to begin by saying thank you for your forgiveness. Lord, I'm sure we are all aware of ways that we feel we failed, ways that we feel we didn't do as much with that shutdown as we could have, that maybe we responded in ways that we now feel ashamed of. Thank you, Lord, that you love us and that you forgive us. Thank you, Lord, for how you're with us in a wilderness time, an in-between time, and you're also with us when things are returned to us, when good gifts are returned. Thank you, Lord, that in 2020, you were the same God as you are in 2021. 
and you're still the same God that you were to the Israelites in the, in the wilderness and the promised land. You're the same God who revealed yourself through your son, Jesus Christ, who died and rose to save us. Thank you, God, for who you are. Thank you for loving us and receiving us as we are. And we pray that we would respond to you, Lord, today and this coming week and year with constant, joyful thanksgiving. Lord, it's in your name we pray. Amen.